Philpop asks, what is the first official Star Wars piece you built for Lucasfilm in the capacity as an employee? It was Newt and Rune's shuttle that lands on Naboo. That is the shuttle that has an almost animalistic set of legs, like crab legs that land in this ramp that comes down and Newt and Rune walk out of it. Um, I had, let's see. I had been working at I had been working in commercial special effects to give you the timeline. I'd worked in commercial special effects through the mid '90s, and around nine, mid '96, Jamie didn't have a lot of work going on, and I moved on to work for a toy company, Zoob, and I was the head of R and D for Zoob for about 18 months. And then when I left that in early '98. I think that was early 98. I decided all my friends are working on episode one. It's time for me to see if I can get into the shop up at ILM. And I started calling Mark Anderson, who ran the shop, weekly. Um, what I did not know was that Mark thought I was someone else and kept like tossing my resume in the toilet. That's what I learned, is that Mark thought I was a different guy that he'd interviewed, and he had never interviewed me. Um, so eventually I had friends that were like, you got to bring in Adam, and he called me up and he brought me in. And he brought me in on a bank commercial. Uh, I built some, we built some large buildings uh, for this bank commercial. And I think my very first job at ILM was to make a desk that would be filmable underwater with a live shark. Seriously. Um, they wanted this shark to look huge. So they had this desk from their practical set, which was a normal size desk. And they asked me to build it one half scale, everything on the desk, every pencil. They had a banker's lamp with a green clear glass and the, the gold stuff, the blotter, everything. They wanted me to build it one half scale. And Mark said, I said, how long do you want me to take on this? And he said, whatever you can finish in two weeks. And I was like, I'm going to finish this whole thing in two weeks. I didn't say that. I finished the whole thing in two weeks. And then, is this what happened? My dad died. Is that true? In mid-98. Yeah, and I had to leave town. I, had to, I So I just started. Here's the thing with a, a union shop like that is you are – you're not an employee, you're brought in as overhire. So there's just this, with a film like that, they had over 200 model makers working. So Mark was managing this gigantic beast of a model shop. And I was in his mind because I was in his sight line, right? I was in the shop, but I had to go home for a funeral, have a, a, a memorial for my dad. And I was going to be gone for like a week and a half. And that felt like I was losing my momentum. And so I said to Mark, uh, so I got to go for a week and a half. What should I do when I get back? He said, well, why don't you give me a call? And I thought to myself, it took me three months to get you on the phone the first time. So what I said was, tell you what, two weeks from Monday, I'll just show up. And if you have something for me, I'll get to work. And he was like, good enough. And so I showed up and he walked me over to Larry Tan. Larry Tan is a delightful and amazing human being uh, who became a good friend and is just a lovely man. And he was working on Newton Rune's shuttle. He had done all the uh, the basic shaping of the ship and now it was time to add some detailing. Um, so I think we passed on the mechanical leg work to Michael Steffi uh, and Larry and I were doing the paneling. And then I just started, Larry was really lovely and fully like open kimono about how the shop worked. So I was saying, hey, who do I need to know around here to get to build more spaceships? And he said, Get to know the Johns, John Goodson and John Duncan, because they did all the prototypes for episode one and episode two and episode three. Both of them are, are good friends of mine now. Uh, and Larry sort of introduced me to the model shop. He was a lovely uh, uh, mentor to have there in those early weeks. And we spent, I think, the better part of a month finishing up Newton Rune's shuttle. I got to eventually wire the lights on it because it turned out that I could do that. I got to paint it, which was so much fun. Uh, and then I got to rig it on set with um, Marty Rosenberg, I think, was the DP on those MoCo shots outside. And we brought it out. And, I mean, you know, it's this thing of, like, you spend a month on this model, which means, like, with all the stuff going on, like, that model is, like, $100,000 of investment from the film company in this thing. And then it's time to take it to the set. And you literally put it on a 
on a, a, a v, an AV cart and you push it through traffic because the model shop was actually across the road from the shooting stages at Kerner. So you put this just like hundred thousand to a million dollar model through traffic to get it to the shooting stage, and you put it out on the shooting stage, and they're just like, they got so much to do. They're like, get it up there, get it up there. Is the light good? Good, shoot it. We're done. Get out of there. Get out of there. I remember me like sitting on my back, wiring a light, and Marty's like, Adam's getting the like crash course education and how how little latitude we give them on the set, but it was great. It was really fun. What was the original? Oh, so yeah, Newton Rune Shuttle, the very first big Star Wars thing I built. And that was great. I got to see it on screen. Mike Finn wants to know, do you think do you think we lose something moving from models and computer motion camera systems like Dijkstraflex to CGI? Yeah, we do lose some things. Mm. The first thing though that we lose that we don't really talk about is we lose institutional knowledge. And what I mean is, um, one of the unspoken reasons that a lot of early CGI didn't look that great is because the people who had the skills to build stuff in CG weren't model makers per se. They could build a CG model, but being able to build a model is only part of uh, the skill that's necessary. Um, and the best way to explain this is that we understand in culture that a film is effectively a pyramidal structure with the director at the top and everyone working below them. But it's not like the director gives a complete vision to everyone in that pyramid. No, 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 no. For a really good film to work correctly, everyone under the director in that pyramid is also taking responsibility for the stories that they're telling. And when you're a model maker in film and you've been working with physical models, you have built, I built over the years that I made models, a, a, a deep amount of institutional knowledge about scale and gesture and how to add scale with these little tricks that we would learn, how to kick light, specular highlighting, outlining paneling with pencil just to get a little more kick in one of the shots, like all these little tiny things that you learn and you pass on and you trade with your with your colleagues and in the early days of cg producers who think that they can get something done cheaper will throw it at the cheapest person that they can afford and get that person to do stuff and it's not that person's fault that they don't have that institutional knowledge not at all but they need that um, so for a long period of time ilm was paying physical model makers like myself uh, to learn CG because they made amazing CG modelers because they make amazing CG models because they show up with all that institutional knowledge. And several of them told me that the feeling they had after building something digitally felt very similar at the end of the day to building something uh, with their hands because they're doing the same thing. They're telling the same kind of stories. They're solving the same kinds of problems. So yes, something is lost when you move from motion control to CG, but I think it, the, the biggest reason is because there's a lag in the, techno in, the, in the understanding of the technology. The other example I'll give for this is, remember in the early 90s when all of a sudden everyone had access to every font in the world on their new computers and graphic design went through like 10 years of just the worst growing pains in the world? Do you remember Mondo 2000? I mean, I loved that magazine and I'm so glad that it existed, but it was a crime against humanity from a graphic perspective. And only because they were trying everything and that's to be celebrated. But seriously, red text on a black background, I just wanna shoot myself when I'm trying to read that. And graphic design went through the same phase I'm describing with CG. It was really rough for a while until graphic designers started to really understand the software and really understand the things that it could do that they couldn't do before. All that being said, Every director would rather have a physical model in front of them, I think, than, than a digital model. It's just, it just gives you more to work with. And there will be perhaps a, uh, a pipeline in the future using VR or AR in which, again, that distance gets shrunk to almost nil, but it hasn't happened yet. And I would show as evidence, if you haven't watched The Gallery, which is the five or six part series on Disney Plus about the making of The Mandalorian, you should watch all of it because it's an incredible education, both in the history of film and in 
using the history of film to do some of the coolest stuff going on right now in filmmaking. Um, and one of the things that they keep on talking about is having practical models, having sets that you can see, having people in costume interacting with stuff like the baby is so important for performance. Not saying that actors can't act in green screens against people dressed in blue and green because they have in tons and tons of movies, but they prefer not to. They prefer to have physical sets to get lost in. <sighs> yeah, I have a lot to say on that subject. Okay, uh, John O'Halloran asks, what do you think about the issue of droids obviously being sentient and having emotions that are owned by biologicals, often mistreated? Yeah, that's a real thing, isn't it? I, <laughs> that's problematic. As you stated, that is super problematic. Yeah. If you want to see a great... Uh, exploration of this issue of what it is to be sentient. Uh, you should watch Animatrix, which is the second best Animatrix. It's the second best Matrix film after The Matrix. The sequels are less good than Animatrix. Animatrix, if you haven't seen it, is eight animated stories, each by a different director, a different uh, uh, visual stylist, different different animation styles, but it's all animated. Some is CG, some is cell animated, uh, some by people you're familiar with, some by people you're not. All the stories are incredible. And there is a two-parter in there about how, uh, how uh, the machines took over. And there are some really, really intense, intense scenes in there, violent scenes of humans beating up androids in a way that is not comfortable and not cool. And it exemplifies that exact issue you're bringing up with your question. And <clears throat> yeah, it makes you question those things. Like we make robots that are that smart. We're going to take them to the dump while they whimper. No, I'm not. That sounds awful. That sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, yeah. Animatrix, man. It's so good. It is so good. And there's a particular one in there. I'm forgetting which episode it is where there's a rift in the matrix and some kids discover it. And they discover something out in the corners of the town that they live in. And they discover that there's a place where they can't hit the ground if they fall. It's kind of amazing. Um, X-T-A-F-A. Zaf? Zafa? Tafa? Shafa? I'm not sure. Um, wants to know, what are your thoughts on the lack of planning for Ray's origins in the recent trilogy? As well as how it pertains to storytelling and planning for a production. I, I appreciate that question. I am not going to answer it in great detail. Um, I am just the actual whole specific plot lines of the three sequels is not readily available in my head like the like four, five, and six. It's just it's just not. Um, and so for me to pretend to talk about Ray and the whole issue of her being a Mary Sue versus her not being with the plot changing as the movies went and Ryan Johnson's vision versus J.J. Abrams' vision. I just don't feel like there's any utility for me to get into this debate. It is big and people feel very passionately about it. And I, 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 I wish there wasn't so much enmity about this sort of thing because there shouldn't be. Um, I think Ray is a wonderful character. I think Ray is a wonderful character, and I love Daisy Ridley, and her her execution of that character is incredible. Um, she's an amazing actress, and I actually uh, Peter Mayhew was a, a, a pal, and the the very last time I had dinner with him, which was I think at Silicon in its first year, um, he said watching Daisy in the first movie, watching her from the beginning of production to the end of production, watching watching her rise to the occasion uh, and really f understand the totality of her role and what her job was, was a wonderful thing. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. Thank you for letting me skate past that one. This video was made possible by Tested Channel Membership. Click join below to learn more about this channel membership. It's a brand new way for you to support us, interact with us, and to help us make the great content that you love to watch and that we so dearly love to make.